Good evening and welcome to the New York Society Library. I'm Sarah Holliday, Head of Events, and it's my privilege to welcome you, both those in the room and those watching online, to this evening's important discussion as we begin three points of business. First, may I ask you to silence cell phones or anything that might disturb the presentation. We appreciate it. Second, we do have books by tonight's presenters available for purchase just outside those doors, courtesy of our friends from the Corner Bookstore. And I'm sure our speakers will be happy to sign copies and chat with you after the presentation. Feel free to have a glass of wine, buy a book, and enjoy. Third, tonight is the last event of the library season, but we've just announced a stellar lineup, if I do say so myself, for next January through March. Many of those events are open both to library members and non-members, so feel free to pick up one of the Legal Science events handouts or check our website for listings. Now it's my pleasure to briefly introduce tonight's speakers. Jeremy Deaton <laughs> writes and edits stories about climate and energy for Nexus Media News. His work can be seen in Popular Science, Quartz, Fusion, Huff, Huffington Post, Business Insider, Think Progress, and Grist, among other outlets. He also manages the climatechat.org, an online guide to the science of climate change communication, which is well worth checking out, by the way. Omar el Khan is an Egyptian-Canadian author and journalist. He has reported from Afghanistan, Guantanamo Bay, and numerous other locations around the world. He's the recipient of Canada's National Newspaper Award for Investigative Journalism and the Goff Penny Award for Young Journalists. His debut novel, American War, is an international bestseller and has been translated into a dozen languages. Roy Scranton is the author of We're Doomed, Now What? <laughs> Essays on War and Climate Change, War Porn and Learning to Die, and Learning to Die in the Anthropocene. Reflections on the End of Civilization. His essays on war and climate change have appeared in the New York Times, Rolling Stone, The Best Science in Nature Writing 2014, and elsewhere. He's currently an assistant professor of English at the University of Notre Dame. Ashley Shelby is the author of the novel South Pole Station, which was a New York Times editor's choice a Shelf Awareness Best Novel of 2017, and the winner of the Lasko Prize in Fiction. She's also a former environmental journalist whose work appeared in The Nation, Sierra, and other outlets. Michael Svoboda is a professor of writing at George Washington University. He holds an interdisciplinary PhD from Penn State, concentrating on ancient rhetoric and environmental communication. He's a monthly columnist for Yale Climate Connections, writing about books and reports related to climate change, in 2016, he published a comprehensive survey of 60 fictional films that have addressed climate change in some way. He's now working on a book that will expand and update that study. Our moderator, Amy Brady, who will take this seat in just a moment, is the deputy publisher of Guernica Magazine and the senior editor of the Chicago Review of Books, where she writes a monthly column about climate fiction. Her writing has appeared in the Los Angeles Times, the Dallas Morning News, Sierra, Pacific Standard, The New Republic, The Village Voice, The Cambridge Companion to Working Class Literature, and elsewhere. She holds a PhD in literature from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and was a recipient of a CLIR Mellon Library of Congress Fellowship. We are so grateful to Amy for organizing this remarkable panel and to Guernica for co-sponsoring this event with the library. Thank you. Tonight marks the fourth event that the New York Society Library and Guernica has co-sponsored just this year. And I couldn't be happier or more grateful to be back in this beautiful room uh, talking about a subject that's very close to my heart and my guess is that you are also all very passionate about. So um, on behalf of everyone at Guernica, thank you, Sarah, and your team for making this event happen. We are absolutely thrilled. Um, for some of you who may not be familiar with Guernica, um, I like to think that we are on everyone's computer screen, but that may not be the case. Um, we are an online nonprofit magazine that publishes fiction, nonfiction, and poetry from a global perspective and often um, with a focus on social and environmental justice. Um, this January, we will be celebrating our 15th anniversary and we could not be prouder of our publishing history. We have published some of the finest writers working today, as well as many talented up-and-comers. 
and um, to celebrate uh, this a long history. We are going to be hosting many more events. So if you'd like to uh, keep up to date on everything we have planned, please go to our website, sign up for our newsletter, and it's free. And um, you will be uh, up to date on all of these exciting endeavors. Um, what you may also not know about Guernica is that despite our longevity and the outstanding work that we publish, we are actually staffed entirely by volunteers. So every bit of money that we make from our fundraisers goes directly to paying our contributing writers and artists because we believe that writers and artists should get paid. Um, so it is the holidays. If you are so moved by the holiday spirit um, and you would like to make a donation to Guernica, uh, please don't hesitate to come up and speak to me after the panel. Uh, I would love to chat with you and tell you more about us. So that is my shameless pitch. I had to do it. Thank you for listening. And, um, and now uh, I want to uh, start chatting with our illustrious lineup of guests here this evening. Um, thank you to all of you also for being here. Um, it means so much to me personally. I have been a big fan of all of your work. And um, the fact that we have so many uh, people who are writing from a kind of different entry points into the subject of climate change is really exciting. And I think we're going to have a very good, rich conversation. So thank you, thank you. Um, to get us started, I thought that uh, I would ask all of you to talk just briefly about what brought you to the subject of climate change and why you pursue it in your work. Um, why don't we start all the way, Jeremy, why don't we start with you? So uh, when I went to grad school to study journalism and communications, I found a couple different subjects that interested me, um, immigration, poverty, climate change, and the more I read about climate change, the more I saw that it encompassed the other uh, areas of interest for me. It's just such a big, expansive issue, it touches everything else, and since I've been writing on it, I've discovered, too, that you can uh, explore all kinds of uh, subjects within climate change, technology, science, public opinion, fiction. And so it's been very rewarding to uh, write about uh, <clears throat> I started out um, many, many years ago thinking I was going to be a marine biologist, and uh, that didn't happen, but I uh, retained my interest in uh, biology and biology. Uh, wound up in communication, I had a stint for the bookstore where I was uh, able to, as beyond the bookstore, you pay attention to all kinds of things, and uh, noticed that this concern about climate change began to take over uh, the environment section of the bookstore. And uh, when I got into teaching, I brought it in. Uh, I'm interested in the, the politics of it, uh, the psychology of it, and uh, the popular culture of it. Uh, so. Uh, that's how I got into watching 60 <laughs> um, When I was about five years old, I, I um, my father, we were, I, I grew up in Egypt, I was born in Egypt, my family's from Egypt, um, but there was no work to be had in, in the mid-80s in Egypt, and so my dad was looking for work elsewhere, and uh, he found a job in Libya, and it was a better paying job than anything he could find, and he found another job in this place called Qatar, which nobody had ever heard of at the time, mm -hmm. uh, but was just on its way to what it would become in the next few decades, which is pound for pound the richest place on earth. Uh, we go to the airport, he, my dad decides to take the job in Libya, but um, my name is Omar Mohammed al -Akkad. My dad's name is Mohammed Ahmed al -Akkad. Mohammed Ahmed is maybe the most popular combination of, of names in the world. Mm. Uh, turns out somebody was on a terrorist watch list with the same name. They took him into secondary, we missed the flight, that's how he ended up not going to Libya and going to Qatar instead. Um, life works this way sometimes. I, I had no say in that. Anyway, um, I, spent, I spent my formative years in, in Qatar where um, a country that essentially would not exist if not for the third largest natural gas reserves in the world. Um, and I remember distinctly when I was very young, there was a, we were reading a, a country government pamphlet on the leading industries of Qatar. Um, and number one was oil and gas, and number two was dates. Um, the, the fruit. Uh, number two was second by quite a large distance <laughs> than number one. Um, and so I grew up in a place that was, that was in the long term destroying itself. Uh, the, the, the area that I grew up in is not going to be uh, fit for human habitation in the next few decades. It's going to be too hot. 
Uh, and so from a young age, I came to associate um, the changing of the world in, in a climate sense with, with um, the, the obliteration of memory and place and all of these things that for me define literature. Um, and that's why it's played a fairly central role in, in, in how, I, how I write and what I write about. Um, I usually trace my interest in the climate change question uh, to a story I did for the nation as a journalist in 2004. Um, I went to Cordova, Alaska, which is a fishing village on Prince William Sound, um, completely decimated by the 1989 Valdez spill. Um, by the time I was reporting in 2004, ExxonMobil had, had spent over 20 years trying to get out of paying punitive damages that they've been ordered to pay. I went up there, I did a story on the people, but I also met a scientist, a government scientist named Jeff Short, federal, federally funded scientist, who said 20 years later there's still oil in the sound. It seemed pretty straightforward, but then I started talking to the Exxon people, and I came to find out they had engaged in a decade-long campaign to destroy this man's career, and they had hired a scientist out of Maine, University of Maine, to say that there was no oil in the sound, and that this man's research was questionable. Jeff Shore took me to an island in the sound, we got on a biplane, we landed, he had a child's spade, the kind that you would use in a sandbox. Um, we were on our knees, on the shore of this island, and he dug out two spadefuls of sand, and the crew just bubbled up. So that was, the, the, the way that's connected to climate change is because that sparked my interest in denialism, science denial, bought science, why corporations would want to manipulate data, what's in it for them. And of course, Exxon has been complete, completely complicit in the climate change uh, hoax. They funded denialists, even as they knew that the research was correct, that, that folks like Jeff Short were correct, that there's oil in the sound, in the sound there's uh, the, the fossil fuels that they're pulling out of the earth are leading to these climate catastrophes. But they pretended like that wasn't the case. So that is how I got into the climate change conversation. My book, South Pole Station, features a climate denier. Uh, it's set in 2003-2004, so I guess it's retrospective cli-fi. I'm not really sure. Sometimes I wonder how it got categorized as cli-fi, but um, that's sort of where my interest came from. So uh, I grew up in Oregon and uh, remember distinctly watching the, the battles over clear cuts, the timber wars of the 80s. Um, and that sort of fed into me becoming an environmental activist in my early 20s, in, at, at which point I had a like, vague general awareness of, of climate change as a sort of background issue to more pressing environmental concerns. Um, and then, for a variety of reasons, uh, and I'm not going to go into here, I joined the Army and uh, went to Iraq um, and came back and went to school. Um, and started writing a lot about veterans and veterans issues and American imperialism and war and our involvement in, um, you know, petroleum wars in the Middle East. Uh, and it was in, it really late in 2013 um, when I had the chance to participate in a seminar at Cornell on um, the Anthropocene and, and post-colonial theory. Uh, and I, I, I wasn't really sure what either of those things was. Uh, <laughs> And it was in reading up for that, uh, reading the IPCC reports that had just come out, the World Bank reports, um, you know, reading some of the literature, David Archer's book, uh, a lot of a lot of stuff on that, uh, and thinking about it over that summer, I I was just floored, realizing how serious the situation was, and 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 how far gone the situation was, and so uh, I wrote a short essay that. Uh, went through my uh, editor I'd, I'd worked for at the Times um, that then became the number one most uh, emailed story on the Times website that day, which sort of opened up uh, uh, my engagement in this in the discourse. Uh, and I've, I've been pursuing it since. Um, now I, I continue to, to think about climate change, but not, it's, it's for me it seems less and less of a of like a, a isolated topic and more and more just the, the the fact that we live in it's the world that we live in now and so it's not a separate thing for me anymore it's just um, the situation. Cool.
Well, thank you everyone for sharing a little bit more about your backgrounds and some insight into your work. Um, it's interesting, Roy, that you say that uh, climate change is just now kind of the situation because I speak with a lot of people who write novels about climate change, um, specifically people who invest in something called uh, world building. They're trying to create um, a world perhaps in the future or the very near future um, that they think has some semblance of reality. Um, and what more and more of them are starting to say is, is that you can't write science fiction unless it includes something about climate change. It's, um, it's just a matter, it's just a fact of life in the future. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure, yeah. I, oh, I think that's absolutely right. Um, but I, I think more to the point, I don't think you could write fiction about the world today without yeah. including climate change in some sense. It's, it's transforming what we understand the seasons to be, weather events, and it's having secondary effects all across the political and cultural spectrum that um, if you ignore those to write, you know, your novel about, um, I don't know what, college life in wherever or uh, a family romance uh, on the Upper West Side or what have you, you know, like, and you leave that stuff out, you're not writing realistic fiction anymore. Thank you. Um, so, um, as you guys can see, we have um, a range of writers up here. We have, you know, novelists, um, you know, academics, journalists, essayists, philosophers, some wearing many hats. Uh, I want to speak to the novelists first, if I may. Um, so, for uh, Roy, Ashley, and Omar, um, a very smart English professor once said to me that any book, well, excuse me, any novel, while it is a work of fiction, can tell us a lot about the society that produced it. Um, books about climate change aren't necessarily new, but mm, there's been a big proliferation of them over the last 10 years. And so, um, as three novelists, you put a lot of writing out into the world. Uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on um, what you think uh, this kind of proliferation of novels about climate change says about our society right now. I think right now we're trying the experience on for size. That's why you're seeing some dystopic treatments of climate change. And in fact, I think that may have been the majority of the classified that we've seen up until this point. Um, and I, I've been thinking a lot about the fact whether we need to re-engage with that term dystopia. Um, I actually looked it up in the dictionary the other day to make sure I had a good grasp on it. Because uh, so many things are being described as uh, being dystopias. And the definition was an imaginary world in which people are living in a dehumanized or fearful state. So then the question becomes, <laughs> is our future with climate change, which it is just going to be our reality. It is our reality. I mean, we may even have to stop using the term climate change and just come up with something else because that almost creates a distance in a way. Um, it makes it sound like some sort of imaginary state when it is our reality. Um, are we gonna have to re-examine what the word dystopia means in fiction um, and talk about when does cli-fi simply become contemporary fiction? Um, it's, it's just something I wonder a lot about. I wonder if you know, these fictional depictions of you know, a dehumanized existence or fearful experience or war, um, is that our future with climate change? You know, resource wars? Or are people going to be adaptive? Are we going to, you know, I, I wrote, um, part of the way I cope is with humor. So I wrote a short story that was essentially just a bunch of Craigslist ads set in a climate impacted United States. <laughs> so there was a guy looking for the natural guardsman who rescued him off of his roof in Charleston, South Carolina. And he said, if this is you, tell me what street my house used to be on. You know, is, is that our future or is it going to be more incremental? Um, and I, I think part of this is, you know, let's try on the experience and see how it feels. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I um, my, my editor is a man named Sonny, who, who uh, a, a while back, uh, publishes a book called The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, which became obviously a huge, huge thing. Uh, and in the years afterwards, you'd go into any bookstore and, and there would be about 400 books with girl in the title. Because it became a thing, right? It became a trend in the publishing industry. is huge on trends because if one book did well, then surely the same book over and over again is going to do well. 
Um, and I think there's going to be an element of that. I think there's going to be an element of cli-fi becoming a thing. And, and so, you know, I, 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 not that my blurb means anything. It hasn't caused a single book to sell more copies, but I get a bunch of blurb requests, and 90% um, of them are, are, are cli-fi. Uh, could be classified as that. And I think part of it is because a lot of writers are really interested in that topic, but part of it is also because it's the thing. It's, it's, it's the next thing. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's, it, there's this quote by, by William Gibson that I think about a lot, which is this idea that the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Uh, and so there's this notion that, I, you know, you write about the future, but it's, it might feel like the future for somebody here, somebody in the relatively privileged part of the world. It's not the future for, you know, if I write about drone killings uh, in, in, in the U.S., which is in, in my novel, um, I didn't make that up. That is somebody else's reality that I've, that I've sort of displaced. Uh, and I think a lot of climate fiction is going to be like that. Uh, it's going to be, hey, this is currently already happening to somebody who lives in Fiji or somebody who lives in Bangladesh. Um, you know, a few years ago, the, 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 during that super drought that California had, uh, I live in Oregon right now, we saw a lot of farmers come up and start looking at farmland in, in Oregon. Um, that's the privileged side of the equation. That's people who can afford to do this in a fairly reasonable you know, way. Uh, that's not going to be the case when millions of people have to leave Bangladesh or have to leave certain parts of Bangladesh. So I, I don't think of it so much as, as in terms of a timeline, uh, so much as things that are already happening to people over here who don't have much of a voice starting to work their way to people over here who do have a voice. Yeah, I, I mean, I think those those answers are, are really comprehensive and I don't feel like I have much much to add to that. Um, I think, like, in the short version, I believe people are just trying desperately to grapple with a changing world. Um, and there's another uh, William Gibson quote, actually, that, or something he said at some point that I wanted to reference, which is uh, related to the one you brought up, which is that um, most people are living uh, about six years behind the time they're actually in, right? <laughs> the, the, the time in their head is about six years in the past. Um, and I think that's very much the case. Uh, um, the really the really visionary stuff, I think, the, the, the really, um, you know, those, those outliers, I think we may not even be able to entirely recognize, right, at this point. Um, and so, in some sense, right, all the, all the climate fiction that's coming out now is already six to ten years behind the clock, right? We're already, it's already too late. Um, and partly that's market forces, and partly that's just this filtering, and partly it's just the fact that it's really hard for us, I think, to, to change our conception of reality, the one that we walk around with in our heads. Um, Michael and Jeremy, uh, you both uh, are prolific critics who have written a lot about um, novels uh, that address climate change, as well as movies, uh, even comic books that address climate change. Uh, I want to get your guys' critical perspective on all of this. Um, what trends have you noticed <laughs> in these narratives? And um, are there any trends in particular that um, you are particularly excited about or that you find particularly troublesome? Um, I think, and I'll speak mainly to film. Uh, the first ones that came out, uh, there were some kind of strange paths by which they became created. The day after tomorrow, I was its origins to a strange book uh, written by someone who also believes that he had been abducted by aliens in the past. Uh, and that book may owe its origins to an Atlantic article, um, which did talk about the breakdown of the Atlantic meridian uh, overturning current. Uh, and because it was successful, that immediately spawned 12 or 13 other Ice Age movies. And so um, this pub uh, publisher's noticing something works, so let's do it again and again and again with slight variations. So we had Ice Age London, we had Ice Age Paris, we had Ice Age Miami. <laughs> um, and they got more and more absurd uh, as, as they just kind of worked through what can we change to release the same story again. And I think that's a, that's a problem with publishing with this. I think there's also a deeper problem there, which when we try to engage with climate change, uh, you get overwhelmed at a certain point, and your brain shuts down, and then it reboots in the policy. Uh, 
uh, because we know the man versus or the humanity versus nature story, and so uh, we frequently recreate that either through a dystopia or an apocalypse, and so now we're back into the matter territory. Uh, it's trying to figure out how to tell the new story that I think is the real challenge here. And I, I think there are, are some who are doing it. I don't know that I've seen it done well in a movie. Uh, I like the work that Kim Stanley Robinson is doing where he's bringing in um, economics and, and uh, uh, social activism as, as part of the how, how do we overturn uh, the society or change the, the economy that creates the problem that we're living in. But I think we have a lot, a lot of work to do. Uh, I was uh, looking at Michael's list of 60 climate change movies today to prepare for this panel, and uh, in that study, you uh, mentioned the different areas they go into, and a lot of them are you know, disaster movies, and, uh, and I was noticing an absence of movies that dealt with uh, climate villains. Climate. Villains. And it's, it's, it's a difficult thing uh, when we want to adapt climate change to popular media like TV and film and comic books, uh, because these are media where we typically see good and bad in a pitched battle, and good, categorical good wins the day. And uh, with climate change, of course, we are the villains. That's not an appealing idea. Um, and I have not seen, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, but I have not seen a lot of movies uh, develop a compelling climate change villain. This is an area where I think comic books might be a bit ahead of the game. Um, this seems like a comic book crowd, so I can uh, talk about that. Um, I think comic books have been a little less reluctant to look at fossil fuel companies and make them the villain in climate change narratives. So you look at uh, the DC universe, uh, which is the comic book universe that includes Superman and Wonder Woman and Batman, and there's a, a big villain in the DC universe called Darkseid, and he's the urban lord of a planet called Apocalypse. You can tell by their names, what they're all about. <laughs> um, and Darkseid and Apocalypse, uh, Apocalypse, this planet goes and eats other planets and takes their resources, and it's kind of seen as uh, representing extractive industries. Um, other comic books have been more explicit about climate change villains. So there was a run of Thor, uh, the kind of thunder, um, where Thor is going up against an oil company called Roxxon. It's a bit of a run of clap on Axon. And uh, he's paired with a, a, an agent who works on environmental issues, and um, he goes and you know takes down Roxxon with a hammer, and he's CEO of Roxxon, and it turns out to be a minotaur, and, uh, and, uh, and that all backfires because you can't just uh, smash everything, and Roxxon ends up suing him, and, and I don't think there's actually a, a really satisfying resolution to that story, but uh, it is one that, that portrays uh, the fossil companies as, as clear going and uh, environmental problems. Um, and lastly, I'll mention Image Comics, which is an independent publisher, uh, has a, a series that came out in the last couple of years, uh, focused on vampires, and the vampires realize that climate change is a threat to humans, which is their source of food, and the vampires go out and start to take on uh, oil companies, they start <laughs> building solar farms and things like that. So hopefully movies will take on some of those ideas. Um, where movies have taken on ideas from comic books that relate to environment, uh, they have tended to make the uh, the bad guy the environmentalist. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. If I would follow up on that. So um, they've announced the the second uh, part of Avengers. Uh, the uh, was it Infinity War was the first part. So the, the sequel to that is coming out, and so the villain in that is the one who's got the the environmental agenda. Mm -hmm. It'll be curious to see how they resolve that. Uh, and whether, as often is the case, you have uh, uh, an acute in, uh, environmental agenda in one movie that is quickly resolved and the entire issue is forgotten and never raised again within the series. So mm -hmm. we've gone from someone who's wiped out half of all of life um, in the universe for <laughs> the Avengers, ostensibly for environmental reasons. Um, I'm going to guess that uh, they'll figure out some way to undo that, but then that will be the last word on environmentalism for. <laughs> for some years, uh, as if the problem has been solved by turning it into uh, uh, an apocalyptic crisis and then solving that apocalyptic crisis. Thank you, guys. Uh, there was a very recent study that just came out that um, a peer-reviewed study that suggested that 
narratives about climate change in the popular culture can have some sort of an effect on the people who, um, who consume them. Um, if we are to take that as a, a premise, then I think a good question that follows is, is how important is it that novelists or screenwriters or comic book creators get the science right? Um, that's an open question, so anybody who wants to take that one. So um, I'll take this one. Uh, <laughs> Michael, you mentioned the, the Day for Tomorrow, which is a big climate change movie that came out about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, in which uh, the Gulf Stream stops and uh, the earth freezes over and um, it was a big deal when it came out. MoveOn.org used it as an opportunity to talk about climate change. Al Gore used it as a chance to talk about climate change. And the movie came out at the same time that a um, field of research into how people think about climate change was in its infancy. And so all these researchers jumped on that and said this is a chance for us to see how does climate fiction uh, shape the way people think about the issue. And there were studies in the UK and Germany and the US and Japan. And it, it found that while the movie tended to raise uh, the concern about climate change among the people who saw it, it also distorted their views of what climate change was, because the movie was pretty inaccurate. The idea that global warming would lead to this new ice age and you know, all these uh, impacts that were not uh, realistic. Um, so people walked out feeling more worried, but also not knowing how much the movie to take seriously. Uh, in one of those studies, they also looked at what was the impact, not just on the movie covers, but on the larger American public. And they found that, a couple studies looked at this. One found that there was a spike in uh, interest in climate change online. People were more likely to search for climate change, to take an interest in learning about the issue, because of the marketing efforts of the campaign, of the movie. And, but another found that the movie overall had no discernible effect on public opinion. So, to answer your question, it would seem that if you want to if you want people to have a, a, an accurate and realistic idea of what climate change is going to bring, it's important for the fiction to portray it realistically. Um, but uh, again, no individual work of fiction is probably going to have a, a massive impact on uh, public consciousness. Great, thank you. Thank you for that, Jeremy. Um, so tonight's panel is obviously about climate change and narratives and um, where those narratives are taking place. And so far we've been talking a lot about very recent narratives, narratives that have been produced in our lifetimes. Um, but Michael, I know that you are uh, uh, an expert in ancient rhetoric and um, uh, specifically uh, in, uh, an expert in the works of Plato. If we go way back to the ancients, back to Plato's time, what could Plato tell us about climate change or um, our, our uh, own kind of relationship to uh, a phenomenon that big and encompassing? Uh, thank you for uh, making that pitch. Uh, <laughs> uh, may I just pause for a moment and, and ask uh, how many of you have read in, at some point in your life some portion of the Republic? How many of you know that um, Socrates was executed by the Athenians? How many of you know that the first person Socrates talks to in the Republic was also executed by the Athenians? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's, that's a problem with the way we, we teach Plato. Uh, Plato lived through uh, the self-destruction uh, of Athens and his defeat by Sparta. And he wrote the Republic, I would argue, in part to sort of answer the question, how could Athens survive as a state? Uh, what would have to change in order for Athens to uh, avoid self-destruction? And uh, he has Socrates, late in the dialogue, uh, suggest that if we're, if we're gonna change the nature of the city so that it is, uh, temperate, uh, prudent, uh, uh, foresightful, uh, <coughs> we have to change the souls of the citizens. And he said, and soul in Greek is psyche, so if we, we have to change the psychology. Uh, and then he says, um, and if we're going to do that, then we've got to change the kinds of stories we're telling our children, 
And that means that uh, if we were looking for an athlete that can survive under these conditions, then uh, we have to stop telling children about the volcanic egos of the gods and these vainglorious exploits of honor mad uh, warriors. Uh, so the question I would pose on that would be, um, what sort of psychology do we need to adopt, develop, in order to uh, address, engage in, in a productive way climate change? And then what kinds of stories should we be telling uh, uh, to foster that kind of psychology? Or conversely, are the, story, the kinds of stories we're telling now fostering that psychology, or are they, they um, uh, fostering uh, uh, an inability, a, 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 a psychological block on the issue, uh, an incapacity to, to, uh, to, to address a challenge of this size and therefore uh, ways of, of disguising it from ourselves? I, I have a, uh, I guess a question or, or um, a comment or something. Hey some form of remark that I will see how it turns out as I keep talking. Uh, that's a little bit inside baseball uh, about Plato, but I'm, I think I can frame it. Um, so I've been thinking recently about uh, this particular interpretation of Plato, particularly uh, so put forward by people like Eric Havelock and uh, Walter Hong, that see Plato not as just responding to political changes, but also to responding deeply to the advent of literacy, right? Massive transformations in media technology that were happening while he was alive. And part of his argument against the poets, this famous argument, throw the poets out of, out of the Republic, is he's, he's not talking about poet, writing poets, he's talking about um, the reciters of, of Homer. He's talking about the people who, who participate in this oral tradition, and he's advocating instead um, some other kind of relation to truth, right? That's not just the received, the received truth that you get from someone who's standing, uh, telling you the Odyssey. Um, and I think I've been thinking about this in relation to, to climate change, and, and because I think one of the issues that we face in thinking about climate change and narrative and how we talk about it is this kind of siloing where we tend to look at the issue um, in isolation without taking into account as well for example, the massive transformation in media technology that we're living yes. through, right? So we have to ask ourselves not just what kinds of stories we like to tell, how we, how we do that and talk about movies and novels, but we also need to think about the way people approach truth and information uh, in a kind of post-literate or, I don't know, um, other literate kind of era, right? <laughs> I don't know exactly how to talk about, right, Twitter and Facebook and social media, but you know, more people read read that those uh, forms of media than they do novels, and, and probably even more than see movies. More people want play video games, right? And so there's a there's a massive question there that I think has to come into how we at least want to think about it and talk about understanding climate change, which is which is um, not just what stories to tell, but like how how are the, the ways that we tell stories changing, right? Um, you know, and I mean, obviously, right, the, um, you know, this, this guy in the White House was able to get there by controlling the narrative in a certain way. Um, and that, you know, and that, that positioning was supported by industries and, and, I don't know, a whole kind of entertainment news mashup that has immense consequences for, you know, uh, stopping or losing the fight on climate change. So I don't, I just, I, I don't have, I don't know where to go with that exactly, but I think it's, it's important to think about. I think I would add to that, that we should keep in mind that climate change is not the only problem we're not solving. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that some basic functions of of government seem to have just broken down, so uh, we're not doing the infrastructure in a productive way, we're not doing those, the social systems that we have in a productive way, we're not doing with our, our tax system in a productive way, so there are things that we used to do, that we used to manage, uh, that for whatever reason, um, 
the change in media could be some big part of the overall picture, but uh, we're not managing those things now. And it's actually conceivable that uh, a ray of hope might be that um, by taking on climate change, we might also sort of rethink the way that we're engaging other problems and, and um, uh, develop a, a, a greater capacity overall. I think that may be way too optimistic on my, on my, on my side, but um, what, you can imagine a configuration of, of uh, carbon policies that could have impacts on infrastructure, that could have impacts on, on uh, social policy, uh, that could be productive. Uh, but it's the, the larger point here is something very fundamental has broken down. And it's not just climate change. I don't want to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank, thank you, Michael. Um, I want to leave plenty of time this evening for you all to ask some questions. So rather than pose a final question to you all, um, if I may, Roy, I'm going to read a quote from your book. Um, uh, this is from his latest essay collection, We Are Doomed, Now What? You can see I'm quite marked it up. And let me just tell you, riding the New York subway with a book called We Are Doomed, Now What? That is this marked up, will get you some weird looks. Um, so this, there isn't a question about this, but I just think that it kind of sums up nicely what this panel was just talking about. Um, in the introduction, Roy writes, uh, it's at just this moment of crisis that our human drive to make meaning reappears as our only salvation. And then he writes, our drive to make meaning is more powerful than oil, the atom, and the market, and it's up to us to harness that power to secure the future of the human species. Um, I think there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, I think that um, uh, the concept of meaning making is very, very important, uh, especially um, when we're talking about the importance of narratives. Um, where they are, uh, how we tell stories about ourselves, and who we tell those stories to. Um, so thank you, Roy, for writing such a beautiful collection. Um, great, so uh, at this point, I want to pitch it to you all. I know you are probably burning with questions yourselves, so please don't be shy. Yes? Uh, Ash, you, in your book, and tonight, you, you, you mentioned uh, how in the book you deal with a denier, and you do nice work with that denier in the book. How do you talk? to somebody who is still a denier in this moment now? Some might say it's a lost cause at this point. One of the things um, I tell my own children who ask me that question as well is um, whether or not they believe it's gonna happen. It, it, it reminds me of Donald Trump saying, you know, oh, I don't believe my own government's you know, climate report. Who cares what you believe? This is science, and it's going to happen. The problem is, you know, he's in a position of power. Um, there's something to be said for um, setting those people aside and letting it, letting the impacts come. One of the things I thought a lot about as you were speaking about the stories we tell is, I long felt that the only way to get through to people is when they are impacted. In Omar's book, his characters are impacted. In the fiction that I'm writing the characters are impacted. Um, go to Florida, talk to somebody who was a climate denier who lost their home in the hurricane, or who has seen sunny day flooding on their streets. Um, anybody in California who was a denier, um, their home's gone in the wildfires. It's interesting how Rick Scott, who forbid the term climate change in any state communications, suddenly became a hero in the evacuations caused by uh, an event that most people believe, was, most scientists believe, was just exacerbated by warming oceans. So what I wonder, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, Omar, is if fiction is, you know, a way of experiencing something where it doesn't impact us directly, but we're kind of um, stepping into someone's shoes, is that an effective way to get people who are uh, not taking it seriously or who maybe don't understand what's at stake to change their mind? Or do you have to be personally impacted? Do you have to lose things to, to have your mind changed? Because if that's the case, I mean, it's going to happen soon either way, but can fiction help? 
So, I mean, it's a really good question. Um, I was I, I, I worked as a journalist for, for 10 years, and, and for the last four of those, I was a U.S. correspondent for a non-U.S. paper. So I was covering this country for people who don't live in this country. And I went down to Florida, and I was doing a story on climate change. I was doing a story on these towns in southern Florida where the mayors are starting to tell their residents, uh, your grandkids are probably not going to be able to live here. You know, it might still be a shipping port, we might still find an industrial use for it, but you won't be able to live here. And I was talking to this professor, I think his name is Professor Wanless, Harry Wanless, I think, and he's been sounding the alarm on climate change for 30 plus years. And he will go to any community group that will have him, and he will give a presentation, and every time he goes there, he'll, he'll take with him a relief map of that particular community with overlays. And you'd say, look, this is what your community is going to look like with one meter of sea level rise, or two meters of sea level rise. And he was telling me that inevitably, every time he does this, at the end of his presentation, somebody will come up and point to the map and say, oh, I'll be okay. <laughs> and he says, yeah, your house happens to be on a hill. You know, you, the rest of the, you have no more infrastructure. You need a boat to get around, you know. But it's, it's this notion of, here's this man who deals exclusively with, with what is rational in life. He deals with the science, the evidence. Um, and what he's coming up against is, is the fundamental irrationality of human existence. Uh, anyone who's ever been in love, for example, knows that most of human existence is not rational. Um, and so what I think of the novelist's obligation is, is the inverse of what that professor is doing. Um, do I care that much about getting the science exactly right? No. Um, I care about getting the irrationality of it right. And I think if you can get to that place, you might have a shot. Um, because that guy who's much smarter than me has been trying for 30 years on the other side of the equation, and he keeps running against that wall. There's a question back here. Yeah, going towards irrationality, I was wondering how do you deal with society being much more individualistic and less concerned about collective action and what might be happening to someone else? Because I don't know, if I consider that a little different than irrational, but how do you, how do you get people to, um, how do you overcome <laughs> sure. Um, it's a very good question, which is why we were looking at each other, hoping somebody else would field it. Um, so uh, another story I did was it was in southern Louisiana. Southern Louisiana is one of the most beautiful places on earth. It's also a place that's um, disappearing at the rate of a football field of land every hour. Um, and every time I give that quote, somebody comes up to me afterwards and says, you screwed up, you said a football field of land every hour. A football field of land every hour disappears. Uh, from it basically melts into the Gulf of Mexico, um, and and one of the things about Southern Louisiana is you go there expecting, why can't these people see what's happening? This is uh, it's the biggest climate disaster in the U.S. And, but then you go to some of these parishes that, because of the oil industry, whose pipelines and whose business has essentially wildly exacerbated what's happening, it's also made some of these parishes some of the richest places in the country. And without the oil and gas industry, they would be some of the poorest. Uh, and everybody there knows that. And so you talk about individualism, I think you address it, you address it head on. Um, we have this, this tendency to try and take self-interest out of certain equations and try to frame them as moral failing because it's easier to discuss right and wrong in that, in that sphere. But, but something like climate change is inseparable from individual self-interest. I talked at the beginning of this panel about how Qatar is a place that in the long run is obliterating itself. It's having a great time doing that. <laughs> it is an incredibly wealthy place, the easiest, like, the highest quality of life maybe in the world. Um, and I, I think you can't ignore that. You can't ignore the function that self-interest plays a huge role in this. Um, I don't know how to solve that, but I think the first step is to acknowledge that this isn't just a bunch of people with, with a bad moral compass that are causing this. Um, this is a phenomenon that's made life a lot easier for a lot of people, and so a lot of us are willing to turn a blind eye to its ruinous effect as a result. Um, that's a really hard thing to change. And sort of building on that, that idea of self-interest also, but, um, and maybe expanding on it, I think there's a, um, I think the idea that if we just could find the right story or like, make the right movie or write the right novel that we could somehow like break through to people's consciousness and change the world I think is is um, not the way that, that fiction works usually right uh, you can't just force a message down people's throats right um, 
it, there's, there's this complex relation of um, readers coming to books and, and movies uh, and, and the things that people put out, right? And so there's, there's some sense in which, you know, Avengers Infinity War is about climate change or uh, Game of Thrones is about climate change, right? Because they're speaking, they are speaking to people in a way, that, this sort of distanced way um, that people can relate to, but they're also, they're not, they're not gonna convince anybody to, you know, get together and collective action, because that's not a message people are really wanna hear, especially right now, right? That, that you can only, as a, as a writer, as, a, as an artist, you can only work in the culture that you're in, and you can, you can think into the future, and you can, you can try to, like, you know, put some vegetables on the plate with the, you know, I don't know, deep fried sausage or whatever. But like, you can only you can only do so much if you actually want to reach readers, right? To a certain extent, you have to you have to reach readers where they're at. Um, and so that's, you know, that's that's one of the things that, at work there. And and I think one of the things that I guess one of the obligations that I think that the the writer has the literary artist or the, the the filmmaker is to is to you know in, in reference to that William Gibson quote earlier is to try to think not about how we fix the problem that exists today, which is you know which is already past right, but to think into the future um, and try to think about what situation we might be dealing with down the road that that we could try to articulate in some way. Well, also, as writers, what do we want the reader to do? What do we want the reader to take away, and then what action do we want the reader to take? You know, there was a conversation I had with um, a, a, another critic, and the question was, is everybody who's writing Clive by an activist? Does everybody who's, you know, Kim Stanley Robinson's most recent novel makes Manhattan seem pretty cool, you know? And, you know, for me, I, I was almost a little uncomfortable with that. And I thought, you know, well, that, why make it seem cool? And this critic said, but maybe the, the point isn't to say that, you know, everything's going to hell in a handbasket. Maybe the point is that we're endlessly resourceful. You know, even if, even if I am, don't share Kim Stanley Robinson's optimism um, in this particular sense, the question then as writers, and I think also as filmmakers, is like what, I mean, and I think the, I think the, I think there's different motives between filmmakers and writers, obviously, so. if you can speak to, but um, what do we want our writers to take away from it? Do we want them to um, step into the shoes of somebody who's been impacted because, hey, you might be next? Or do we want to tell a good story? Do we want to entertain people? Or do we want them to start massing together and, you know, vote climate? I mean, I got that bumper sticker on my car, vote climate. I mean, is that what we want them to do when they read our books? And that's something I grapple with. So I don't know um, where you think maybe in terms of film, too. How, how that plays into it. Uh, so, two quick comments. One, um, I think we should also celebrate the fact that there have been some sort of steady changes in both novels and films on the social front, but in terms of diversity of, of characters and the strength of women characters. And that, I, I think we, we can see social changes uh, implemented as a matter of fact, and I think it, uh, across novels and films in a way that, that is very positive, and, and suggests that maybe long-term changes might be possible with something like climate change, if, it, if we put it in the background as opposed to foreground, that it becomes part of every, every film we do. Uh, but in answer to your specific question, I, on my way up here, I was wondering whether uh, you could do a test of something like social capital, which is related to the collective action. There's, according to sociologists, there's been a steady decline in social capital. Could we come up with a way of measuring social capital in novels and, and find out whether mm. social capital has declined in novels mm. as well as in real life? That in other words, the novels are, are reflecting that. And uh, I don't know, but that was an interesting idea. I just want to go back to this idea of what is your goal uh, if you're writing a book about climate change? What is your goal for the reader? Um, I did a story a few months back on why there are no good blockbuster movies about climate change, and for that story I interviewed, uh, by critical 
appraisal. There are no good ones. Um, and for that story, I interviewed the head of screenwriting at UCLA and asked him about how would you make a good story about climate change, and his response was, I wouldn't. So don't ever tell my students to make a story about an issue. You make a story about a character. And I think that when we see a story that um, has been saved an issue, it's probably because that was bubbling up inside the author's head. So if Jordan Peele makes a movie about benevolent racism and Get Out, I don't think that's because he set out to make a movie about benevolent racism. He probably just had that rolling around in his head and made that movie. But, um, but I've never written about a novel about climate change, three of you have, so maybe you guys can answer that question. That's what Margaret Atwood said. She said climate change is not a character. And um, that was very instructive for me because I think even when I'm working on my work in progress, I slip into that. You know, I do so much world building um, that then you forget at the heart of the story is because it's literature at the end of the day. You know, you want to create art. Um, and you know, there's, I'm a little uncomfortable with that at times too because, you know, creating art out of suffering, um, you know, it's an age old question I think writers ask themselves. Um, in this case, it's, it just feels a little bit more poignant because it's how it's unfolding right now. I'm continually going back to my work and taking stuff out. Stuff that I thought was speculative happens in real time. Um, but I do think you're absolutely right. It's about character, and um, and that's how we. I think that's how we can touch the issue on a deeper level. Is that can we relate to these characters? I mean, anybody who's read Jane Eyre has never forgotten that woman, that young woman, um, and you know. I think if we can do the same thing in work that touches on what's unfolding right now, as you say, contemporary fiction, um, then maybe we can get people thinking about their own lives before they're impacted and then are forced to reckon with it personally. Thank you, Ashley. Um, on that note, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I do want to respect the time of the New York Society Library, and I'm afraid I think we are out of time. Um, so, let me just thank uh, Jeremy, Michael, Omar, Ashley, Roy. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you all for being here. There are books for purchase just outside this door. Uh, if you don't have copies of their books, please purchase one. They have generously agreed to uh, sign a copy for you. And um, I'm sure if you have a lingering question, they would be happy to answer it for you as well. So thank you all so much. And yes, lots of refreshments. Please help yourselves.